Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Glad to see you here this morning. Finally, the sun is out after lots of rain. I hope it's a warm, sunny worship service this morning. If you turn to your bulletin, we have a meditation to start our time this morning from Michael Goheen. This is the mission of God, to restore the creation and the life of humanity from the ravages of sin. The church's function in this story is to participate in God's mission. We are to be caught up in God's own work of restoration and healing. This defines the identity and role of the church.
Thank you, Becky. Thank you, Scott. Good morning once again. We're glad to have you here this morning, whether you're visiting with us or here every week. Uh, welcome. We hope that you'll stick around after our service. Uh, we've got some refreshments out on the porch. It's going to be a beautiful day, so we hope you'll stick around and get to know us. Uh, a couple announcements before we uh, formally begin our worship together. Uh, first, we just uh, concluded our spring Sunday school series on church history. Uh, we ended in the middle of things in the 7th century. Of course, we're still in the middle of things today. Uh, but we will be taking a break from next weekend through 4th of July weekend, and then we'll return with a new series uh, for the rest of the summer after that. So stay tuned for more details on that. I also want to highlight uh, some announcements found in your bulletin. Uh, first, the Love Your Neighbor discussion group will happen again uh, this, uh, a week from Friday on the 31st about having healthy conflict while loving others. If that's something that interests you in joining that discussion, please let Ruth Hoover know. Uh, her email is found in the bulletin. Uh, second, for the men of the congregation, uh, I want to make sure that you're aware that there will be a barbecue at Mike Erickson's on June 28th. So mark your calendars now. It'll be a great time of fellowship for the men of the congregation. So we hope to see you there. And with that, uh, let us take a moment to prepare our hearts for worship. Please rise for the call to worship from Psalm 24. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, and does not swear deceitfully. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Father, we come to you as your people, redeemed by the blood of your Son. We thank you and we praise you for the salvation he has won for us. As we begin our worship this morning, we ask that your Spirit would be present with us, that he would lead us as we sing to you, as we lift our prayers to you, and as your word is preached. Would we go forth from here today more fully equipped to live as you have taught us and to love as your Son loved? It is in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us join together in singing hymn number 16. Come, let us sing unto the Lord. Hymn number 16.
We come now to the time when we confess our faith together, and I want to ask you a few questions. What are your bedrock convictions about the world? What things do you believe most deeply about who we are and the way the world is? What do you really believe about God? Do the words we recite in the Apostles' Creed week after week register among those deeply held beliefs? As we profess our faith together, take it as an opportunity to examine your beliefs. And where these core doctrines of the Christian faith are not deeply rooted in your heart, pray to the Lord, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. So with that, let us profess our faith together with the words found in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. The scripture reading this morning is from Isaiah chapter 35, verses 3 to 10. Please read along with me in your Bibles. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals, where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there, and it shall be the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come up on it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads, shall be upon gladness and joy and sorrow, and singing shall flee away. This is the word of the Lord. Of the Lord. The passage we just read serves as a very good lead-in to the next portion of our worship, where we confess our sins together. Our passage reads, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. The verses I just quoted teach two things. First, that the Lord will come with vengeance against sin. But second, that he will come and save you. And this is what he has done in Jesus Christ, poured out his vengeance on sin, and in so doing, accomplished salvation for each of us. And this is why we can be strong and fear not as we confess our sins. So let us confess together. We, a poor sinful people, confess ourselves before you, our Lord God and Maker, that sadly we have sinned much with our senses, thoughts, words, and deeds, as you, eternal God, know very well. We regret them and beg your grace. Most merciful Father, forgive us our sins because of Christ, 
and lead us to eternal life through Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Please take a moment to confess silently. Now hear the promise of pardon from Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 6. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ. In response to this good news, please rise and sing number, hymn number 189, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know, hymn 189. Dearly beloved, my friends in Jesus, it's good to be back. It was good. What mic am I using right now, Adam? Whichever one you want. Whichever one I want. Let's use the lapel. Can you hear me okay back there? Good. Good. Thumbs up. Great. Well, it's good to be back with you all. I missed you all. Thank you for your prayers. And I've been getting emails and texts from people who have been signing up for our little prayer thing that we've been doing where you dedicate a day to pray for Cresham. And uh, I so appreciate that everyone who's done that. It's very sweet to get an email and saying, hey, I'm praying for Crescent today. I'm, I'm devoting it to, uh, to my love and, and my heart for Crescent. So that's great. We come now to our time of congregational prayer, and we go together to the Lord as one people. 
And as always, we have a time of thanksgiving followed by a time of supplication. So let's go to the Lord now. Oh, Father, we come to you, and I'm so thankful that Jesus loves me, even me. He loves all those who call upon him. But Lord, that is the hardest truth in the world to believe so often for us, that you love us, and that Jesus loves us. It may be a children's song, but it's a song that we must always sing every day. Lord, help our unbelief, help our doubts. Lord, we pray that now, as we look over our lives and over our week, maybe our morning, maybe around the pew, and we consider everything we have to be thankful for, would you well up in our hearts deep gratitude, recognizing that every good thing comes from your hand. This place to worship, this beautiful place to worship, the music, the friends we have, the spouse, the kids, the family we have, the food we ate this morning, the bed we slept in last night, the sleep we got, all came from you. We praise you for that. We thank you so much, most of all, as we start our time of thanksgiving, that Jesus loves us, and it is by grace, by grace, by grace, and by grace. And I'm so thankful for that this morning, Lord. So now, hear the good thanksgiving of your people. Lord God, thank you for your Sabbath rest in Christ. Mm -hmm. Thank you for Jesus. Lord, thank you for hearing our thanksgiving. The ones expressed and the ones not expressed just now. Lord, I thank you that you are so abundant in blessings for us. We thank you that you have raised us up with Jesus. And that no matter what our lot in this life might be, the lot in our next life is beyond our imaginings. We thank you for the hope that is. We thank you that even in the midst of our temptation to be hopeless, especially for those of us who are dealing with tragedy, depression, or dire circumstances, Lord, we thank you that there is always a cause for hope in you and in Christ. Lord, we thank you this morning for our community here and for the ways in which you've been faithful to this church over these past several years. Lord, I thank you for the friendships that exist here and the deep community I see every week, brothers and sisters leaning on one another for encouragement and prayer, to be challenged, to learn from one another in wisdom. Lord, we praise you for this church and thank you for what you're doing here. Keep the work, Lord. Keep it going, we ask in Jesus' name. Lord, we're thankful that it's okay to be needy before you and that it's okay to be needy before one another. So often, we're more ready to be needy before you than we are between or before our neighbor or friend. Forgive us for that, Lord, and help us now to be needy before you, expressing our needs, asking you for your grace and your help in all sorts of circumstances. Here now, the supplications of your people.
Lord, help us do this your wisdom as we struggle to speak to the kinds of things our grandchildren are facing before today, Lord. All the confusion, all the lies, all the sin. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Reveal yourself, Lord, to a culture which is indifferent. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, we come to you. We ask, Lord, that you continue to watch over us, protect our loved ones. Lord, I thank you for the sound of children in our church. Thank you for each and every one. Watch over and protect them, we pray, for our covenant children. Lord, watch over and protect our singles in this church. Bless them right where they're at. We pray for the marriages of our church. And we ask, Lord, that you would bless and help them, especially those that are struggling. Lord, we pray for the parents of our church. As it's such a long task raising children. It's such a joyous thing, but requires such perseverance. Lord, we ask that you would bless them as parents in our church, that you would give them energy. Lord, and guide them as they raise up their children. Lord, I pray for the community groups and Bible studies of our church. We thank you for what you're doing in the midst of them. Would you bless them? Lord, and I pray for those here who don't have such a community, like a community group or a Bible study. Help them, Lord, to get connected and find what they need there in terms of relationships and friendships in Jesus. Lord, I lift up to you as well this season that we're in as a church seeking to revitalize and as the elders are discussing vision and values and the impact we want to make here in Northwest Philadelphia and the needs of our church. Lord, would you guide the elders, guide us all as we pray and think about these things. Lord, thank you for the many people who provided invaluable feedback in the poll we sent out recently. We pray that you would help us to discern those things and know what's best for our church. Thank you for our document and the ways in which they meet the needs of our people. Bless them, we pray. Lord, we pray for our city as you command us to, and I especially pray for those parts of the city that are burdened with such violence or burdened with poverty and need and broken family situations. Lord, we pray that you would give Christians in those areas of the city such courage to stand in the gap and minister in love and word and deed. Lord, we pray for our city as a whole that you'd be faithful to be faithful to all the churches in the city, help them themselves to be faithful in word and deed and in sacrament, Lord. We pray for the leaders of the city as you command us to. We ask for righteous and just and wise decisions. We pray the same for our state leaders and our national leaders and representatives as you command us to. We ask, Lord, that during this time of division, this time of confusion, even in the church, such conflict in the church as I've even seen recently in our own denomination, Lord, we pray that you would grant your spirit to help us to know how to have healthy conflict, to have healthy discussions over divisive issues. Help us, Lord, to know how to love and build unity despite difference. Lord, help us to be anchored on the truth of Christ and his mission and work in this world. Lord, we pray for this world abroad. Lord, we thank you for the missionaries that represent us. We lift them up to you now and we pray for them that you would bless them provide for their financial needs, provide for their emotional, physical needs, and for their families, and bless their ministries. We pray for all those who are seeking to spread the gospel to every tribe, nation, every tongue, every people, every home in this world. Bless them, Lord. Spread your gospel. Fulfill the Great Commission through your people. We lift up to you, especially the wars that we continue to see. We think of all the horrendous suffering and devastation in Ukraine. Lord, we ask for relief. We ask that you end wars. We think of Gaza. We think of the wars that are going on around the world. We think of the natural disasters we hear about in the news and the ways in which it causes such devastation that lack and last generations. Lord, we ask, oh Lord, that you would stand with your church in those areas, help them to bring relief and to bring the gospel to bear. We ask for aid and help. And Lord, we ask most of all, come Lord Jesus, come. We long for you to come and to make this world anew and to bring us into the new heavens and new world that you have prepared for us. So Lord, come, Lord Jesus. And until then, we pray as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, we'll continue worship now by offering back to the Lord a portion of what he's given to us. This is a moment of joy for you. Give out of grace, we pray.
seated. You sound beautiful this morning. We haven't met yet. My name is Jonathan Richardson, the pastor here at Crescent Valley Church, and we are in John chapter 5 this morning, getting back on with our Gospel of John series. Took a little break there with Bob Inberger and Alfred. I hope, I hope you treated Alfred and Bob, hope they treated you guys well and gave you the word. I heard some good feedback, but it's good to be back. So this morning, we are going to be looking at John chapter 5. And we are moving on from the section of 1 through 4 of John, which is really largely about Jesus interacting with various people, revealing about who Jesus is and why he's come. And now, chapter 5 and onward, we see increasing hostility for Jesus. Lots of hostility. We're going to see some today. We see that Jesus heals a man on what Jews call the Sabbath day, which is a day of total rest commanded by God in the Old Testament. It's the fourth of the Ten Commandments. And it's modeled after God himself, who, as we know, rested when? On the seventh day. It was the same pattern of rest, six days of works, one day of rest, that God commanded for Israel. And the Jews had some strict rules around the Sabbath, as we'll see today. But first, I want to start out with our big idea and a question. Our big idea today, kids, is this, the work of Jesus. That's our big idea today. And I want to ask you this question, what is the work of Jesus? What is the mission of Jesus? Evangelicals will have a ready answer to that, no doubt, as many others will. But sometimes I think our brothers and sisters can miss the larger picture, as can others, of what the gospel ultimately accomplishes. Today, we get a reminder of the complete whole mission of Jesus and why he has come, not just to bring forgiveness or to rescue our souls, but to bring restoration and healing to our God-given humanity and this world. So let's go to our passage this morning. We're going to be starting in verse 1. We'll read to verse 17. John chapter 5. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed. And he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My Father is working until now, and I am working. I have three points today. Thank you for your patience. I have three points today that together reveal the mission and work of Jesus. First, Jesus cares about your body. Second, Jesus changes why we obey him. And third, Jesus has come for your soul. So, three points. Jesus cares about your body changes why you obey him, and Jesus has come for your soul. So let's start with the first point. Jesus cares about your body. So Jesus goes to Jerusalem, and on the way to the temple, he passes by the healing pool called Bethesda, based in the northeast part of Israel, in Jerusalem. The words means house of mercy or outpouring, and it was seen as a pool of healing. That's why people went. And as far as we can tell, the idea was that they would go and they would wait for the angel to come down and stir the pool again, and once they stirred the first one in, would be healed of either their uh, sickness or their disability. So, out of all of these, you have a group of invalids 
is what's called here, and maybe a better translation I would put would be disabled. The blind, the lame, and the paralyzed are waiting around the pool, aiming to be the first ones in. And here you have this man who's sitting there by the pool hoping to get in. Can you imagine how desperate he is? Can you imagine how desperate they are sitting around this pool just waiting? Because this is not a time where there's braille, as there is today, or wheelchairs. There's not a time when there's disability checks or when there's social services. They have no hope but to be healed, and they're all gathered around. This guy here, it says that Jesus sees this man and knows he's been there for a long time. He's been lame for 38 years. So Jesus goes up to him and asks him, would you like to be healed? Would you like to be healed? Which is a strange question. He's there, right? Of course he wants to be healed. That's why he's there. Why would he ask that question? Well, Jesus' question is pointed, actually. It's not merely about being healed of his disability. It's beyond that. Do you want to be healed? Not just of the fact that you are disabled, but beyond that. Jesus is asking this man, what does he really want? And yet he also wants to heal him physically, as he does. And it raises the question this morning, do you want healing from Jesus? Whether it's physical or spiritual. What kind of healing do you want from him? We all have burdens and struggles. Some of us have chronic illnesses, disabilities. Some of us are mentally burdened, depression, anxiety. Some of us want to be healed of past tragedies that we can't get out of our head. Some of us are looking for healing from trauma that shows up every day in our lives. And here, Jesus goes probe us into wondering, what do we really want? What does this guy want? For now, though, what is clear is that Jesus cares about this man's body. The proof of that is that Jesus, despite knowing that he won't be grateful and that he, don't, he doesn't even ask for healing, he just complains to Jesus. This is not a person of faith, okay, as we see. Remember the rest of our story. His response shows that he's not a sweet old gentle man. This is a man who later blames Jesus for violating the Sabbath, who would have given his name if he remembered or met who Jesus was, and later once he meets him in the temple, he goes back and reports him to the Pharisees, knowing, I'm sure, what might happen to Jesus. This is not a time in which you do something bad, like today in a church, and people just criticize you or shame you or kick you out. That's the worst that's going to happen anywhere in one religious denomination. This is a time when the Pharisees had the authority to kill you. In other places, when Jesus violated the Jewish understanding of the Sabbath, you remember the Pharisees, it says, afterwards figured out how to kill Jesus, how to destroy him. So, this man handing him over to Jesus, handing Jesus over to the Pharisees after this healing is a big deal. How does he respond to Jesus here? He says, basically, of course I want to be healed. But he has no one to help him into the pool. I can almost hear him saying next, so you stranger, are you going to do something about this? But then Jesus does something that no one expects, right? By the mere power of his voice, he tells him to get up and take his mat and walk. People must have thought he was crazy or cruel to hear this from Jesus. Just a guy says to this guy who's been sitting here for 38 years, why don't you just get up and go over there? And then something completely unexpected happens. He stands up. He picks up his mat, his bed, and that he picks it up signals to us the complete nature of his healing. This is no off-brand Walmart healing, okay? This is on-brand, the good stuff. Life is changed for this guy. This is the real deal. Notice he was not healed because of faith. Did you notice that? We have no indication at all that this guy, one, had faith before, or two, had faith after the healing. And notice that it was by sheer grace and by Jesus' care for this man's body that he got healed. Not by faith. He has a higher goal, of course, in this healing as we keep going through the passage. But first, I want you to sit here at this moment and notice about what Jesus is doing here. What he is saying. He reveals something powerful about the salvation he offers. Think about it. Jesus himself took on a body. Jesus here in this scene is walking around with a human body because he became incarnate. 
Jesus is not pro-illness. He's not pro-disability. He is anti-sin, which has corrupted not just our souls, but our bodies. It has corrupted the world around us. Because of sin, diseases exist. Because of sin, there is murder. Because of sin, there is mental illness. He has come to reverse the curse of sin. And all his healings are evidence of that, especially even here. Jesus cares about your body. Have you ever thought about that? Jesus is not just here for your soul. He's here also for your body. This is why we pray for healings today. Here in the West, especially in more intellectual denominations like the Presbyterian Church in America, which we're a part of, we forget about the supernatural elements that Jesus promises even here. Jesus, God, heals people even now. It's why Christians around the world celebrate miraculous healings. There's no guarantee that he'll do it in your life, but he does it. And I don't know if Jesus will heal your illness or disability or your broken family or your loneliness, but he will provide for you. He's the one who provides your, your medical care. We have doctors here. They've been trained to do a great job and serve, but who provided for them? It is Jesus who provides your medical care. It is Jesus who provides your home. It is Jesus who provides the makeup you put on this morning, the dress, the jacket you have on, the fact that our room is comfortable, the people that sit around you, this church he has provided for you physically here to enjoy. But one thing that's certain for all of us, Jesus promises one final certain healing for your body. One day you will have every illness Every anger, every depression, every brokenness, every limb lost, everything will be undone. The sadness, the anger, the depression from all that will be undone. Death itself will be undone. And we will be transformed. Listen to Paul in Galatians 3. How is this going to work out? But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. One day, you will be transformed to have a body like Jesus's. Unreal. Unreal. Which means I won't be balding, hopefully. I'll have lots of hair, maybe long, glorious hair then. My friends, what this means is we need to pray for healing. Do not be shy. Do not just pray for spiritual things. Pray for healing. Trusting the Lord may answer or not answer that prayer, especially for those who have gone down to the pool and are helpless, like those at the pool in our story who have no hope but to get healed. Never treat as strange or as other those with chronic illnesses and disabilities. Here's Jesus on the way to the temple. He comes to this pool. He does not treat this man as strange or other at all, but heals him despite his lack of faith. How often do Christians, or do we personally find people who have lots of physical issues, whether they're in a wheelchair, or whether they have trouble speaking, whether there's something about their brain, and we treat them as other, as, a, as something we feel good about. Well, I talk to them, so I must be a pretty decent Christian. No. No. Rest assured, and preach that hope to everyone, that not only one day will you pick up your mat and walk like Jesus has here with strength and health forever, but preach that you will also, no matter the lowliest person, the person you dislike most in this room, by Jesus will pick up a crown and shine with a body like Jesus's. Amen. Here's the problem of our passage, though. What Jesus has done leads into a familiar controversy, doesn't it? Many times, Jesus has conflict with the Pharisees over his Sabbath practice, and this will lead us to our next point. Jesus has come to bring healing to our way of life by changing why we obey him. By changing why we obey him. The Jews found this man and saw that he was carrying his mat on the Sabbath. <coughs> and they said, you violated the Sabbath. Now today, we obviously don't have those type of rules. You see, at this time, you're not allowed to work on the Sabbath, and we often think of work as employment, don't we? Yet, 
The Jews at this time had work broken down into 39 different classes. Okay, I've looked at the classes. It, it takes some memorization, trust me. It is a very detailed way of living according to the Sabbath. One of those is that it's prohibited to take one thing from one domain to another. You're not allowed to pick up your mat and carry it from one place to another domain. That's considered work. Seems very silly to us, maybe some of us, but it's very serious at the time. And the man does not try to defend his work. Notice that when the Pharisees come up to him, the Jews, and most likely Pharisees in our passage, but simply blames the one who healed him. He does not name Jesus as he doesn't know who Jesus was. He walked away and then Jesus slipped away as well. He will name him soon, of course. But we can assume that once they find out that Jesus healed on the Sabbath, not just this man was carrying a mat on the Sabbath, that they are especially angry. Because in other accounts, like in Mark 12, I'm sorry, Matthew 12, Mark 2, Luke 6, the Pharisees see Jesus heal on the Sabbath and they want to kill him for breaking the Sabbath. You can't heal on the Sabbath. It's a work. Of course, Jesus points out the hypocrisy. That none of the Pharisees would hesitate to grab their animal if it fell in a ditch on the Sabbath, and yet he can't heal somebody on the Sabbath. How does Jesus reply? Well, in those stories in Matthew 12, Mark 2, and elsewhere, he replies by calling out directly the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Like, guys, what is wrong with you? I'm doing something compassionate on the Sabbath. I'm fulfilling the law. I am spreading the gospel on the Sabbath. And he calls them out for using the law to curry the favor of God and boost their self-righteousness and police others. Instead, he says that the Sabbath is for the good of mankind, for their human flourishing. He says explicitly, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And yet they still want to kill Jesus. Here in our passage, however, Jesus replies in a unique way. Nowhere else does he put it like this. He says what? My father is working now, and I am working. What's he talking about? He's saying his work of bringing healing and salvation to his people. He doesn't stop that work. Sunday's not a day to stop that kind of work. Not at all. His work for human redemption. Think about it. The Sabbath still is practiced today. I, as a Presbyterian, believe in the pra practice of the Sabbath. I believe it falls on Sunday the day that Christ was resurrected. I'm called today to rest mind, body, and soul in the truth of who Jesus is. And yet, what is Jesus doing right now? He is working in your hearts. Jesus is at work. He is having compassion on you. He's using my words. He's using the M's. He's using one another. He's using this afternoon when you sit down with the Word, you sit down with family, or you sit back and rest. Jesus is always at work. And he's working today. The Sabbath, even as we rest. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. Because Jesus won't stop until he brings us to the final healing, the final redemption of mind, body, and soul, and the new world he has prepared for us. But let's pause here for a moment. I just want you to see that the Jews understood the heart of the law. This is the only example with the Sabbath. There's all sorts of examples. They did not get it. They did not get it. And so often, I don't get it either. It's so easy to prioritize the things that we're good at. I don't struggle as much with this, so I judge others for struggling with it, whereas I personally, I can tell you, I struggle with pride. I struggle with fear of what you think. I struggle with lying sometimes. I don't judge people as much for fearing what other people think or lying because I struggle with those things. But there's other things I don't struggle with, and it's easy to judge others. The Pharisees were no different, these Jews in this passage. But Jesus has come to heal our relationship with the law. The Sabbath, like all God's laws, are meant for good. They're meant to change our life, to live like God intended human beings to live. It is not for us to have Christ. The law is so that we can become like Christ. Did you hear me? We don't follow the law to have Christ. We follow the law to become like Christ. And that's the fatal mistake. As I was saying, we're talking about the Jews who misunderstood the heart of the law, right? It reveals their hypocrisy. And part of what I think is going on here for Jesus is he's reminding us of a new reason for why it is that we obey, the reason why we should have obeyed all along. 
We obey Jesus not to have him, but to become like him, like I said. We obey Jesus out of his love and grace, not to earn his love and grace or to prove our righteousness or moral superiority. We obey knowing that the law is good for us and is about our flourishing and becoming like him. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The law was made for man, not man for the law. And this, my friends, that means that Jesus has come to heal your self-righteousness and your Phariseeism. We all have it. I've got it in my heart. You have it. He has not come to abolish God's law, as he said explicitly, but to fulfill it so that we would not be judged by it. That is why his life counts as our own. And brothers and sisters, let me remind you what Jesus taught us about the law. It is not meant to be a burden or a tool for policing. It is summed up in one word. And what is that word? Love. 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 Love is the fulfillment of the law. Love of God and love of neighbor. The life we were meant for, those who follow the law of love, exhibit what? They exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. Which means your obedience should look like what? It should look like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Can you imagine a world of Christians that exhibited that and how good that would be for the world? You know, like me, you know, I grew up in the South in Alabama, and there's a lot of cultural Christianity in the South. Uh, people would just go to church and they say they believe, but there's, you know, there's really... They really don't take it that seriously. It's just part of the culture. Um, but one thing you do see a lot in cultural Christianity, I think, is a lot of legalism. And by that, what I mean is that there's certain laws that people will take in the Bible, certain codes, moral codes, that they will take as precious and then judge all sorts of people by it. I've seen it in my own family. I've seen it in friends. I've seen it in my own heart. When I take certain laws as more important than others and I judge others to make myself feel better. Here... Obedience does not look like pride or superiority. Obedience looks like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Is that what your obedience looks like? Why do you follow God's law? When you judge others, why? God's love for us, though, shows up most clearly in His work for our souls. We talked about His work for our bodies and the promises he makes one day to transform them. We've talked about how he redeems the law for us and shows us the way. And now we talk about his work for our souls. And this leads us to our final point. Jesus has come for your soul. Jesus has come for your soul. He more than cares for it. He redeems it. Jesus finds the man in the temple. The man perhaps had gone to the temple to offer thanks for his healing. Jesus is there ready to connect his body with this man's soul healing, isn't he? Notice we skipped over that as we skipped down to Jesus' answer about his father working and his working till now. But he finds this man and he tells him what? Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. That is first and foremost why Christ lived and died. To bring redemption to our souls, to raise us to new life. To turn us around from sin and unto himself for salvation. Where there's forgiveness and acceptance before God. Here he calls him to use the body signal of healing to see the soul signal he's trying to communicate. It's not just your body, my friend, that needs healing. Your soul does, and it's in me. Now some people, some commentators, will say that what Jesus here means to say is that he needs to repent before anything worse happens to him in the sense that he was paralyzed, he was lame because of sin. And if he doesn't Turn away from saying he's going to be worse than lame in this life. I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced that that's what's really going on here. I believe Jesus means to say that the healing of the body is of no account at the end of the day if your soul is not healed. I don't know if you know this. This is a fascinating statistic. It may come as a great shock to you. One for one human beings die. We laugh. But we try our hardest not to think about that most days of the week, don't we? One for one human beings die, which means you, I'm sorry to say, will die, whether you're three or 80. 
The question becomes, what's next? It's more certain than your life tomorrow is that you will die one day. And if your soul is not healed, death will not be your end. A death that is eternal under a just God who sees all that you've ever done, thought, desired, said. Without the healing of your soul by Jesus Christ, you cannot enter the world of love that God is preparing for us. It is a perfect world where there is no pain or crying. There is no evil thoughts or jealousy. There is no murderous intent. There is no poverty. There is no diseases. There is no crippled people by the pool. Only those who have been perfected in soul and body can enter. And only by grace in Jesus do we find that perfection. And yet this man is unlike many others healed by Jesus in his earthly ministry recorded in the Gospels. This man doesn't get the message. He's, there's no thanks to Jesus recorded. Notice that. There's no thanks in the passage recorded. There's no exclamation. Wow, he's so powerful. Who is this dude? There's no faith recorded for this guy. There's no even question as to why when Jesus confronts him in the temple. He apparently leaves very quickly after encountering Jesus and goes back to the Pharisees, I don't know, to save his own butt, and says, hey guys, I found the guy, it's Jesus, it wasn't me. For all he knew, Jesus would be delivered up to the religious court for condemnation and would be destroyed by the Pharisees as they so often attempted. And we the readers are left to assume that this dude doesn't become a follower of Jesus. He was healed. It's clear Jesus did it. And yet, it's the best of possibility for us that maybe he became a believer later. This, Jesus, uh, this makes Jesus' warning all the more grave, doesn't it? There's no greater sin in the Bible than to reject the identity of God, specifically Jesus Christ. That's unbelief. It's the only sin. It's the only sin that will keep you from the eternal reward of Jesus and that he's accomplished for us. The healing of this man's body, a body was meant to communicate who Jesus is and why he has come. It was meant to bring healing to his soul by the blood of Jesus. And all good things in this life are like that, my friends. Let me remind you of that, the health of your bodies. If you woke up this morning feeling pretty good, that's supposed to remind you of who Jesus is. The help of medication and medical care. We have doctors in this congregation, but the reason they are doctors is because God sustained them and gifted them with the ability to go to med school. The reason that you have medical care is because God provided it for you, no matter how many different steps there are to getting medical care. The good food that we might have here in a little bit as we hang out for fellowship hour, that I might have this afternoon, or the really good tacos I had last night. What is that supposed to communicate to me? That God is good. They're meant to point us to Jesus. So, beloved, do not miss this message. Jesus more than cares for your souls. He has bought redemption for them. And anytime he heals you, and I've seen miraculous healings in my life, anytime he heals you, it's not about the healing. Anytime he gives you good things, it's not about the good things. It is about pointing you to Jesus. And that's what's supposed to happen here with this man. He's supposed to get the message to repent and turn. Jesus more than cares for the soul of this man. He is willing to give up his body. Notice that it is Jesus who is willing to become crippled on the cross, to suffocate to death as you do. That's how crucified people died bleeding and suffocating to death because they couldn't hold up their bodies any longer. He was willing to subject his body to pain, trauma, sorrow, torture, and death. Why and how? By the violent death only reserved for slaves and criminals. That You don't need to be a Christian to recognize that Jesus faced the worst of death in the first century. Crucifixion. Why did he do it? Why did he give up his body to pain and his soul to suffering as even his own father turned on him and treated him like the epitome of all evil and sin and what's wrong with you and this world was so that he in your place could pay the price that you deserve to pay so that he could heal you fully, body and soul and mind beyond your wildest dreams. As it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. I don't care how much you thought about heaven. You have no idea how good it is. And it is coming. And the body that he will give you. 
that our bodies will be transformed to be like his glorious body. And what does it require of you? Faith. Faith. And so I ask you this morning, do you want to be healed or not? Do you want the healing that Jesus has for you? If we're being honest, some of us want it, sort of. Some of us don't really want it. We just want to have a healthy, wealthy life sometimes. But Jesus promises a healing that is beyond just a lame person getting up and walking. Because you know what the problem is with us so often, and I end on this note, we settle so much for the comforts of this life. We settle so much for the comforts of this life. And not for what Jesus has for us, body and soul. This is why the poor, the oppressed, the suffering, the disabled, the blind, the lame, the addicted, the mentally ill are in a better position to long and be desperate for Jesus than I am. And to know Jesus in a way that I don't. Which means that you and I this morning, at the very least, you need to go back to the pool of the gospel. And trust that he will get you in the waters of his grace again. And you will begin to experience the healing of your soul again or for the first time. Go to the pool of the gospel. Go. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and we're thankful that the pool is always available. That the waters of your grace never run out. We're thankful, Lord, that you do answer prayers. That the history of your people testifies that you show up. You show up in dire circumstances. You show up in broken bodies and you bring healing. Not always, Lord. We know that the final healing, the final undoing of evil is coming. And it is not now. It is not here yet. But we know that now you have redeemed our souls by faith in Jesus. And that you are working on our souls. You are sanctifying us, as theologians say, day by day. Making us what? Into the image of Jesus. So that we can become like you. Lord, we pray that you would bless us as a church and guide us. Help us to know, oh Lord, that you care for our bodies. That you know our pain and suffering. Help us to know that you care about our way of life. You call us not to live like the Pharisees, but to approach the law as you have. Out of love. Love for God and love for neighbor. Knowing, O oh Lord, that your grace and love is already for us, even if we fail. Lord, we thank you most of all that you have bought redemption for our souls. And that now we can trust in Jesus and be raised to new heights. Lord, lift up these people now in this afternoon. Help us to rest on this Sabbath day. Help us to be filled with a rest that's beyond words, knowing that one day everything will be okay and the best is always yet to come. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we conclude our service, we're going to stand and we're going to sing our final hymn, which is... Four fifty-seven. That's right. Come, thou fount of every blessing. And I chose this because God's got a lot of blessings for us. Pray. Come, thou fount of every blessing. Please stand when the music begins.
seated and meditate on these truths. benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.